What's in a name? You may have never asked that question to yourself before. We know what William Shakespeare said. He said, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And I agree with his part about the rose. A rose is a rose is a rose no matter what we call it. But a name's important. Your name is important. My name is important. See, names that others give us and names we label ourselves with carry much weight in our lives. They, they spur us on and build us up or they drag us down. I can look across the congregation today and, and, and I can see names everywhere. And not just your given name, but the other names we call ourselves. Uh, pastor, teacher, um, pharmacist. EMT, firefighter, CPA, nurse, and on and on. Some of those we claim for ourselves, some others have given us, some build us up, some tear us down. Those names that I just used aren't ones that we use to tear each other down necessarily. They're they're labels that describe things we do or have done in our lives. Even as Barb pointed out, she's been retired for some years, but she's still a nurse. Yeah. That part of us never seems to go away. Sadly, though, other names we call ourselves or others call us seem to never go away either. There's a wonderful book called Hind's Feet on High Places that tells an allegorical story of a deer, D-E-E-R, following the great shepherd. It's a story of, of, of someone coming to faith and, and moving through their development as a Christian to reach the high places where God has called them to. The main character is a is much afraid. What's her name? She's deformed. She has deformities in her face and on her feet. She lives in the Valley of Humiliation. With her adoptive family, the family of fearlings. See the names? But she comes to faith or comes to accept the good shepherd and she becomes a a shepherd for the good shepherd. And he calls her to a journey to the high places. He introduces her to two companions that will travel with her along this journey and their names are Sorrow and Suffering. She follows a path that he gave her that goes through the forest of danger and tribulation. And the furnace of Egypt and the valley of loss and the precipice of injury. And through the grave on the mountain. As she goes on her journey, her adoptive family, resentment, Bitterness and craven fear, pride and self-pity try to drag her down and drag her back to the valley of humiliation where they think she belongs. But she fights the good fight to do her best to reach the high places. And as she reaches the high places and the story culminates toward the end, Her traveling companions, sorrow and suffering, are given 
a new name. Joy and peace. And much afraid is given a new name. Grace and glory. Our scripture speaks of that today. In verse 17 of Revelation, we see God in Christ speaking to the church. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, which no one knows except him who receives it. We have a white stone this morning to symbolize that and smaller white stones around it, each symbolically engraved with a name, your name. But let's get back to my name, John. In Hebrew, it means Yahweh is gracious. How many of you know the meaning of your Christian name? Depends on what book you read. They have ten different answers for the same thing. Usually when you get that baby book, you know, you, you get pregnant the first time and you go out and you buy all of these wonderful little things to learn from and study from. And one of them is a baby, baby name book. And, and you start leafing through all of the names and, and your uh, dog earing certain pages so you can come back to it and you're underlining and you're highlighting and you're arguing with your, your husband and wife about what name you'll call this wonderful blessing. And all of them have what the name means. But you know, that's not always how we're known. And... Yahweh is gracious, it's not often what I call myself. Sometimes the things I call myself are not very good names. Remember, as a young person, laying in bed at night, wondering if anybody really cared about me. If anybody would miss me if I was gone. Who would show up to my funeral? Now that seems a little morbid for a teenager to think. But I imagine that some of you have had those same exact thoughts. As you name yourself. Horrible name. or as you agree to the names that others call you that are no good. There's a biblical example of that. Biblical example is in Ruth chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. You all know the story. Ruth had gone away and her husband died and then her two sons died and her daughter-in-laws were with her and, and she encourages them to go back to their homeland before she travels back to hers. And and we know that Ruth stays with Naomi. But as she reaches the border of her homeland, which was Bethlehem, it says, and I'm actually going to go back to 19. So as the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem, that's Ruth and Naomi, the whole town was stirred because some of them said, can this be Naomi, don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Naomi in Hebrew means pleasant, but she has renamed herself bitter. Because the bitterness of the loss in her life has been something she's not been able to overcome. She has cast aside her given name and taken upon herself an injury, a pain, 
a sorrow. God did not call her Mara. Her mother did not name her Mara. But that's the name she held on to. Names can direct our paths. They can heal, injure, even kill body and spirit. So I ask you today, what do you call yourself? Besides nurse, teacher, doctor, student. What are those names or labels you've, you've attached yourself to that you know in your heart of hearts God does not call you? Loser. Bad father. Mean, stupid, ugly, failure, disappointment, horrible mother, bad child. Or maybe some of you sit there and you're so well adjusted that this is going right over your head. Take that as a blessing. But for those of you who are here today that this resonates with you, that it rings true in your spirit. I want you to recognize that those aren't names that you need to hold on to. Those are things that you can let go of and let God take away and find your true name in Christ. That wonderful name written on the white rock that God calls you. A name that many of us don't answer to because it's just so foreign. I read a blog post this week, and I'm actually using that term appropriately, uh, by a woman named Sarah Gerard. And she's writing a little story about herself. She says, Hi, I'm Sarah G. And I'm just going to read, read this to you all. The biblical meaning of Sarah is princess. The American meaning is happy. When I was two years old, I was diagnosed with a rare form of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. And my eye was surgically removed and now I wear a prosthetic. I was so young when the trauma occurred that I have many memories of growing up in and out of the hospital. And I even have more memories and experiences of how others responded over the years when I tell them what I have been going through. See, there's darkness in being different. We might think or at least hope that kids wouldn't make fun of the sick kid with the prosthetic and that adults wouldn't look down on her with pity and shame as if she was a lost pet. But kids are the most brutal about the things that they don't understand and adults pity the things they wish would never happen to them or theirs. Sicko, weirdo, freak... Oh, what a tragedy. Oh, poor soul. How miserable your childhood must be. Hearing it repetitively over and over for decades makes it really hard not to believe. So I started identifying with their reactions, naming myself with the same rejection and shame that was being reflected to me. I was a sick, poor soul, a freak, a tragedy. I desperately wanted to fit in, so I tried to disappear in the sea of other girls with my name. If I could just be another Sarah, I could escape being me. Now, she has in her adult life come to grips with her self-given shameful names and no longer claims them as her own. She's gone through a true process of healing in Christ. But she says this as she closes out her, her blog post. 
The names we call ourselves matter so much more than the names others call us. See, the the devil wants you to hold on to those horrible names. Those labels that, that you get stuck with from a child that carry on into your adulthood. And although no one else may call you that name anymore, it still reflects in your head as you. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Not a loser, not a freak, not a weirdo, not a disappointment, not a horrible parent, not a bad child, a child of God. That's what we need to hold on to as believers. What God's Word says about us. Not what the world says about us or what we've come to know ourselves as. We need to get to know ourselves as God sees us and knows us and calls us. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Those are names that God calls us. that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. A royal priesthood, a chosen people, a holy nation. And the next one is such a a, a wonderful name. God's special possession. What is something that you hold dear? A possession of yours that, that you love. Now imagine that love multiplied an infinity amount of times. And that's how God sees you. A special possession. It's by by recognizing what God's word calls us as, as God reflects upon us that we are able to let go of those other labels that we've carried for so many years. In Revelation 2.17, he says, I will give you a white stone with a new name written on it. And it says, which no one knows except him who receives it. But I know the name written on the stone. I know the name written on my stone. And I know the name written on your stone. It's beloved. You are loved. Beyond compare, as a special possession, as a chosen person, as a child of God. You receive that white rock, and upon it is written, Beloved. Now, it might have something else on it as well that that only I will know, but I only care that I am beloved by the Father. And I can let go of some of those names that I call myself even today because I am beloved. We're going to take a minute of reflection. And as you reflect on God's love for you, I encourage you to come up and take a white rock. It will not be the same rock you get in heaven. But it is one that you can set on your bookcase, put in your backpack, carry in your pocket. So that when you start to hear those names, loser, weirdo, stupid, you can look at this and you can see beloved. If you want a white rock this morning, We take a couple minutes of silence. I just ask you to quietly come and pick one up. Put it in your pocket. Put it in your purse. 
And let it remind you of that day when you get to heaven that you'll receive that stone with that special name written upon it. But you don't have to worry or wait what that name will say. It will say child. It will say beloved. It will say special possession. Because that's who you are. In God's mind. John eight forty four, the second half of the verse says the devil is a liar and the father of lies. He wants to tell you that this is just stupid. A little rock doesn't mean anything. There's no name on it. I'm just going to throw it out in the yard when I go outside. Sadly, some of you came up simply because everyone else was and you didn't want to be embarrassed sitting there not coming to get a rock. And some of you sat there because you said, I ain't going up there to get a rock. Everybody else is just doing it for nothing. That's the liar. That's the enemy. He wants you to go by those old names. Loser, idiot, stupid. You can't do anything right. That's probably one of the names I've carried the longest in my life. You can't do anything right. And I've probably reflected that to you all on occasion with words that I've shared. Growing up in a home with a perfectionist father who things had to be done his way and naturally only he could do them, that whenever he asked me to do something, I couldn't do it right. It was never good enough. And as a young Christian, I just transferred those those attitudes and feelings that that I got from my earthly father to my heavenly father and knew I would never make him happy because I couldn't do anything right. I was nothing but a failure. And that's why as a teenager I'd lay in bed having those thoughts... Would anybody really care? Would anybody really miss me? Because I thought the people in my own home wouldn't miss me. Or wouldn't care. But the devil's a liar. And I've learned that I don't have to go by that much afraid name anymore. That I can claim my new name, my name of beloved. These wonderful names that the scripture points out to us, we are children of God. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are saved. We are washed clean. We are redeemed. We are sanctified. What wonderful names to be called. And we are called these names because God loves us. And and one day we'll take up that white stone in heaven with that beautiful name, Beloved, written on it, and and maybe another name that only you will know. But it will mean beloved. It will mean accepted. It will mean forgiven. It will mean sanctified. It will mean washed clean. It's time to let go of that old stuff, because that old stuff keeps us today from encouraging each other and supporting each other and challenging each other and being united as a body of believers. It's not that we hate each other or or, or that we just love to fight with each other or I'll never listen to what he says or she says. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with what we call ourselves.
Start calling yourself loved and chosen and forgiven. And then we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can be united as a community of faith. And we can encourage and support and challenge each other. And we can begin making even a bigger difference out in the world out there. We need healing here. But see, we serve a God who is a healer. We serve a God who's in that business. So let go of that old stuff that, that, that holds you down, that, that causes you to, to trip and stumble, that, that drowns you in sorrow and self-pity. And let God raise you up and change your life. But so you, you've got to come to him. I stand at the door and knock and nobody answers. Sad. God's not going to kick the door down like the SWAT team. But he's going to be there persistently knocking on your heart of hearts. And he's going to go, beloved, it's me. And you're going to go, Nobody lives here by that name. It's called, beloved, it's me. And, and when you're ready to accept that name, when you're ready to hold on to, to that special, special blessing and say, you know what? I think God's knocking for me. I think he's calling me beloved. I think he's calling me forgiven. I think he's calling me cherished. We will run to the door and throw it open and fall at his feet. And he'll say, beloved child, why did you wait so long? I want to speak to our teenagers and our young adults right now. Don't wait till you're 50 to get the point. Get it today. Let go of that stuff that the world wants to hang on you and claim your white stone and the name written upon it. Amen.